Last July I made this leaf headkerchief and I got a lot of comments from people who also wanted to make one. I did do a blog post about the process and included a pattern diagram, but I didn't take as many progress photos as I would have if I'd known there'd be this much interest in it. So I thought a video tutorial would be useful. I tried to explain things as thoroughly as I possibly can, so hopefully it's beginner friendly. It is a time consuming project, but not a particularly difficult one. I like to include different options, so I ended up making three for this video. I'll start out with a very simple smooth edged one with just a hem and no facings, and then two with serrated edges. These will be similar to the first one I made, but with a couple of different techniques for the veins. I've put all three of my patterns on inch grids to make them easy to scale up, and they're in the accompanying blog post. So if you want to use those and skip ahead to the sewing part, there are timestamps in the description. But if you want to do a different kind of leaf edge or just prefer to draft your own patterns, here's how I do it. The basic design is pretty simple. Four leaf tips arranged in a square. The midribs go from corner to corner in a large X, and the veins come off at 45 degree angles, nicely filling up all the space and looking very leafy. I based my original one on an elm leaf, but you could make yours with any sort of leaf edge you want, as long as the shape isn't too extreme to be able to tie. Start with a square that's one quarter the size you want your finished leaf kerchief to be. The pattern for my first one was 38cm squared, but I found it was slightly bigger than I wanted, so this square is 36cm, meaning my entire leaf kerchief will fit within a 72cm square. My head is 59cm around, so if yours is significantly larger or smaller, or if you just prefer a different size, you may want to scale the pattern up or down a bit. We start by drawing a diagonal line from corner to corner, and then more lines branching off it, parallel to the edge of the square. I'm staggering them slightly because I prefer the look of asymmetrical veins, but you can do them symmetrically if you prefer. I made these lines closer and closer together as I went towards the tip, but had I looked more carefully at my reference leaves while doing it, I wouldn't have put them quite that close together at the end. This first one is just going to be a very basic leaf with simple hemmed edges, so a pattern isn't strictly necessary for the cutting, it's more for the veins on this one. But I would like to shape the tip a little bit, so I'm just curving it in and making it a bit shorter on this corner. When folding a pattern in half to cut through two layers, I recommend using binder clips so the layers don't shift. You'll also want to curve the ends of the veins down towards the leaf tip so they aren't just completely straight lines. Next I'm cutting little rectangular holes in the veins so I can mark them onto the fabric. If you have a tracing wheel and that's sewing tracing paper stuff, that would be a faster way to transfer the vein markings onto the fabric. But since I haven't got any of that paper, I'm making it so that I can easily use a fabric marking pencil. I could have put far fewer on the straight portions because I'm going to join them up with a ruler later, but oh well. On the curved vein tips, I made them a bit closer together. The second one I'm patterning here is based on these poplar leaves. For this one I made the lines a bit closer together as I got towards the corner, then left a pointy tip that's a bit longer than the last gap. When deciding on vein spacing, it's important to remember that only part of the pattern you're drawing will form the big leaf tip on the back of your head, so do a sketch first to make sure you're happy with the number of veins and the size of the serrations. Like this pattern is one quarter of the finished piece, and only about a quarter of that pattern will be the bit that shows. Like that, you want this bit to be your leaf. The serrations on these leaves are less pointy than the elm leaf one I made first, and I'm sketching a wavy line around the edges to try to imitate that. For the other two corners, you want the edges to line up when you trace them. Here I'm using my clear grid ruler to mark a straight line one centimeter in from the edge, so that I can scoop out a little curve there that's the same depth on both sides. I can't fold this one while cutting it out because it's asymmetrical. Okay, now onto the actual sewing. For the first one I'm using this pale yellow linen which I got on sale years ago and which is a pretty decent autumn leaf color. After washing and ironing it, I smoothed it out on my table and began tracing the pattern with a water soluble marker. Don't mark the lines for the veins yet, we're only tracing the outside edge. The veins will go on the other side of the fabric later. I'm tracing all four sides of the pattern so that I can line them up with each other, which is extra important with a shifty fabric like this. The amount of seam allowance you leave may differ depending on how wide you want your hem to be. I'm cutting mine with about a centimeter and a half because I want my hem to be half of that. If this were a finer fabric, then a tiny rolled hem would be nice, but this is too heavy and loosely woven for that, so I'm doing a basic double folded one. I'm doing mitered corners, but you don't have to if you don't want to. 
also prefer to hand baste my hems before sewing them because it makes it faster and easier, but again, it's not strictly necessary. The slight curve I added to the corners is no trouble to hem with this fabric, but with a wider hem or a stiffer material it might not work as well. If you're sewing the hem by hand, I strongly suggest using silk thread, or cotton, or linen if you can find one in a close enough color. I find that polyester thread is too twisty and tangly, which is very annoying for hand sewing. I'm doubling my yellow silk thread and thoroughly waxing it, then sewing the hem with a little whip stitch. You can sew it by machine if you want to, but it will be much more visible. Now that the hem is all finished, it's time to do the veins. Spread the kerchief right side up on the table, place your pattern on it, and begin marking through all the little holes, or using a tracing wheel if you have one. Or if your fabric and pattern are see-through enough and you have a light table, you could put the pattern underneath and trace the lines on that way. Lots of options for doing stuff like this. I'm tracing all my little dashes with a washable marker and then connecting them with the ruler, except for the curved tips. If the veins on your pattern are perfectly symmetrical, then you can flip it over if you want, but if they're staggered like mine, then do not flip it over. Lift the pattern up and rotate it around to the next corner, but don't flip it. If you rotate it, you'll have a nice even spacing in the middle where everything intersects, but if you flip it, you'll end up with two pairs close together and two pairs farther apart. Before starting the actual painting, I strongly recommend doing a sample. In fact, I recommend always doing samples for any new technique or material you try. You will never regret doing a sample, but you may very well regret not doing a sample. Samples are good. Do samples. On my first leaf kerchief, I hand painted all the veins on with a thin brush, and getting them smooth and even was incredibly tedious. I think it took at least 8 hours to do the whole thing. On this one I decided to mask all the straight lines with painter's tape, and then finish up the curved tips by hand, which was much faster. For these veins I'm using acrylic paint mixed with textile medium. The masking worked well, but the first mixture was too thin and soaked through the fabric. I also wanted a darker brown, so I mixed in a lot more paint and a little more textile medium, and it was much better. Some of the reference leaves I picked up had a bit of green left around the veins, and were browning at the edges, so I tried adding that to my sample, but wasn't too thrilled with it. I tried again on a second sample, but still didn't like it, so I decided to stick with brown, yellow, and orange. Quick side note about the paint I'm using for most of the rest of these colors. It's not actually paint, it's speedball fabric ink, and it's meant for screen printing. The only reason I'm using it is because I have a whole bunch left over from textiles class, and I still haven't bought any actual fabric paint, but please do not buy this for painting. It's really not ideal. The textures are super inconsistent. Some are pretty thick, some are very runny, and some are weirdly gelatinous. So just get normal fabric paint or textile medium to mix with acrylic. I'm going to keep calling it paint for the rest of the video just out of convenience, but know that it is not paint. Once you're satisfied with your sample, it's time to move on to the actual painting. It's best to start with the midribs, a word that I didn't know until I googled parts of a leaf while writing this. They ought to be a bit thicker in the middle of the square, tapering down to a fine point at the corners. I'm masking them with painter's tape because the adhesive is very mild and shouldn't leave goo on your fabric, and is very easy to peel off. I have had regular masking tape leave goo spots on fabric, so it's better to use painter's tape. Try not to put too terribly much paint on your brush. The more that soaks through the fabric, the stiffer it will be. It's also best to move the brush along the length of the lines and not side to side, because to get smooth edges you want to avoid little blobs of paint getting under the edges of the tape. When the midribs are dry to the touch, you can remove the tape and mask out the straight portions of the veins. These also look best if they're slightly tapered. Be careful not to paint past the bit where the ends start to curve. Switching to a very small brush, paint all the curved ends on the veins. With these done, it now looks like a leaf, and you can stop here if you want. <laughs> 
I wanted shading on mine, so I'm dry brushing the orange on with a larger, fluffier brush. This was still quite small, and I switched to an even larger one later. I would not have done quite this much shading if I liked the original fabric color more. I'm only doing one half with the orange because I want this to have two different tips. Only one half of the leaf kerchief shows while it's being worn, so you can do the two sides differently to make it more versatile. I did the first side as a nice bright autumn leaf, and the second side as an older dead leaf that's probably been on the ground for a while and is about to be eaten by fungus or worms. I'm using the same brown as the veins, plus some lighter brown and a bit of black on a few of the spots. You'll also notice that I redrew the veins for this end because I wanted them to be a bit more curved. Now the painting is all finished. The leaf kerchief in its current state is not washable, so you need to let it dry completely and heat set it. Leave it somewhere to dry overnight, and maybe clean the paint off your table. The next day give it a good long press with the hottest iron setting you can. I use a press cloth and try to make sure my iron is spent at least a minute or two on every part of the fabric. Your fabric paint might have heat setting instructions on the label, or you might have to look them up online. I've also read that you can use other methods, like a heat gun, but I've never tried that. Now you just need to wash it to get rid of those marker lines, and it's all finished and ready to be worn. To put on your leaf kerchief, fold it in half diagonally, putting the corner you want to show on the outside face down on the table, and just a little bit lower than the one on top of it. Then fold down about 4 or 5 centimeters of the long edge so the other two midribs are hidden. Place this folded edge against your forehead with the leaf tip pointing up, and tie the two pointy corners together in the back in a square knot. The tip will have probably drooped down over your face, so move it back and tuck the sides in so that the back corner is a bit narrower and more leafy looking. Of course, there are lots of different ways to wear a square of fabric on your head. This is just the way I wear them. This one goes nicely with a couple of my 1790s waistcoats. It also ended up almost matching that 1770s Werther's wrapper waistcoat that I made in another video, which was not intentional, especially since that waistcoat isn't very wearable. Okay, that's the first one done. Now onto the more complicated version. For this one I'm using a quilting weight solid green cotton, and the facings are a much finer white cotton. Both pre-washed so they don't shrink. I used a white pencil to trace the pattern for this one, and it doesn't show up very well on camera, but just like the first one I'm tracing around the four edges and rotating, not flipping, the pattern. When you cut it out, it's best to just go straight along the edges and leave a wide seam allowance, but keep it about the same width on all the edges. It'll get trimmed later, and cutting closer at this step would just be a waste of time. Now you'll need to cut out four strips of the finer cotton to make the facings. They need to be wide enough to cover all the wiggly edges, plus a large amount of seam allowance. I cut mine about 8 centimeters wide, and the same length as my square. Next, the ends need to be cut off at an angle. To do this, I take a long ruler and line it up with the center of the square and one of the corners. I mark a little line on the seam allowance so I can see it, and then do this on another corner. I then place the strip along the edge of the square, a little higher than the edge so I can see the mark in the corner. Then line the ruler back up and mark my diagonal line. This is the stitching line, and you'll want to cut it with about a centimeter of seam allowance. You could make a pattern piece for this and it would probably save some time, I just haven't bothered to yet. Do this to all four strips. Now pin these ends right sides together and sew them. Make sure your stitch length is very short and don't backstitch. No backstitching is needed at either end for these seams. I'm using plain old polyester thread for this, 
Press the seam allowances open on all four corners. Then spread your big square of fabric on the table with the right side up and the traced outlines down. Spread your facings out on top with those open seam allowances facing up so the right sides are together. Smooth it out really well. You want the facing fabric laying perfectly flat on top of the main fabric. Now pin the facing on all the way around. The traced outline of the serrated edge should be visible on your main fabric, and now you can sew along it. I'm using a stitch length that's a tiny bit longer than I did for the mitered corners, but still pretty short. This step is very tedious, and going around the pointy bits requires a lot of lifting the presser foot with the needle down, pivoting the fabric slightly, sewing a few more stitches with the hand wheel, and then pivoting again, but it's really worth the effort of going around all the tips so they turn out nice and rounded and even. Once you've gotten all the way back around to the beginning of your seam and done a little back stitch, it's time to trim the edges. I recommend leaving about 3mm of seam allowance here. It should be narrow enough to not be bulky, but not trim so close that the edge will fray and come undone. Next, clip the seam allowance on all the inner curves so that it won't cause any puckering when the edge is turned right side out. Be very careful not to cut through the stitching. If you do accidentally clip through the stitching, just sew around that part again a little further in. Unpick about a centimeter on the end of each of the seams at the corners of the facings to make it so the edge can be turned in. Yes, I could have backstitched and stopped a little further in from the edge, but I didn't want to add more bulk there, and this corner will be secured later. I'm folding in the edge and pressing it now, but this step can wait till a bit later. It'll need another press either way. Now it's time to flip the edge right sides out. It's best to have some sort of tool to help with the serrations. I'm using a bamboo point turner. Making sure the whole seam is worked all the way to the outside edge is pretty annoying, but I find having a bit of water on my hands helps them grab onto the fabric better. Carefully iron the edge flat as you go, and try to keep the facing fabric just a teeny tiny little bit further in from the edge so it doesn't show. This nice flat edge will not want to stay nice and flat, especially once it gets washed, so it needs some top stitching to help with that. I'm using a cotton thread in the closest color I could find in my fabric. Like the first strip around the edge, this is pretty tedious and requires a lot of lifting the presser foot and pivoting, and I use the hand wheel for a good portion of it. My apologies to anyone whose machine has one of those stiff, awkward, small hand wheels. The ones on all the vintage machines I've used have been very smooth and ergonomic, but the modern ones I've tried aren't, and I don't understand why. If you want the stitching to be less noticeable, you could instead do a small running stitch or a prick stitch by hand. Once you've gotten back to the beginning of your top stitching, overlap the ends by a few stitches. You can backstitch if you want, but since this is visible, I prefer to finish off the ends by hand. <laughs> 
going to hand sew the inside edge of the facing, and I didn't have any silk thread in the right shade of green, so I'm using white. I'm just using a single strand this time. The facing ought to be ironed one more time to make sure it's nice and smooth before you pin it down. Start at one corner and do a few whip stitches around the end of that angled seam that we did in backstitch. Though if you did decide to backstitch this seam when you sewed, that's okay, and it won't need any extra reinforcement. Sew all along the facing with a slip stitch, with most of the thread going through the folded edge, and just catching a few threads on the outside fabric. This part won't have to take much strain, so you can make the stitches fairly long. Do a few more reinforcing whip stitches on each corner. If any part of this process seems intimidating, do a sample first. Maybe even several samples. Samples are good. Now it's ready for painting. Lay your pattern down so that the edges line up with the shape of the hem, and trace the lines on just like before. I started with a light blue pencil, but that didn't show up well, so I switched to a pink one to connect the dashes together. I tried a different technique for the first half of this one. I've had these little squeezy bottles since textile class because we used them for resist dyeing, but I wanted to try using them for fabric paint. These are from my college supply store, but you can get them online too. Dharma Trading Company has them. They've got little metal tips with different sized holes. I mixed up a nice dark green and added just a tiny bit of water to make it flow better. I tried one of the larger tips first and it drew well on the sample, so I moved on to the actual leaf. I tried doing the midrib and all the veins with the little bottles, which was not a good idea. I should have just used them for the thinner bits. They did make the veins look more organic, but the ones on actual leaves tend to be way more smooth than this, so I'm not sure if I like it. They were great for these smaller wispy veins, though. The main downside of these bottles is that you have to squeeze them constantly while painting with them, and it puts quite a lot of strain on your hand. So I do recommend these bottles for small details, but not if you have any recurring hand pain problems, and not for long stretches of time. It's important to clean the tips as soon as you're done using them, so they don't dry out and become clogged. I put mine to soak for an hour or two in a little dish of water, which gets a lot of the paint out of them, but there's still more inside after I rinse them out, so you'll probably have to soak them a few times before the water runs through them and comes out clear. I wanted this leaf kerchief to have white veins on the other half, and after doing this edge with a little bottle I decided to switch back to masking with painter's tape. This time I masked the end of the veins too, just to make sure I wouldn't get any paint on the other side of the midrib. I painted these just like the veins on the yellow one, finishing up the tips with a small paintbrush. That is not lined up at all. How was I paying so little attention? Update on those little pencil marks that you can see through the dark green veins. They did wash out, but so did a lot of the ink on top of them, so now they're just little blank spots. I did push pretty hard when drawing the dashes, which left a lot of pencil material on top of the fabric, but the more lightly drawn marks with a pencil that contrasted better were fine and didn't do this. Another good reason to do samples of everything. I dry brushed some darker green around the edges of the half with the dark veins. Another update from the future, the dry brushing hasn't held up very well to washing. I think maybe because the paint didn't really get into the fibers, it's just on the surface where it's more prone to rubbing off. On the yellow one, it's also pretty worn looking along the edges, but not too bad in the middle. They've both been washed multiple times now. <laughs> 
Seeing as this stuff is ink meant for screen printing, I'm guessing you might not have as much of a problem if you use actual fabric paint, but I don't know. Just something to keep in mind. I gave the whole thing a good long press to heat set it, washed it to get the pencil markings out, and then ironed it again. With the long edges folded in a bit, only one color is visible at a time, and the weird two colored ribs in between aren't a problem. This one goes okay with a couple of my light green shirts, but I really need more green things in my wardrobe. For this one I wanted to use stash fabric only, so I chose this dark brown quilting cotton and used it with the wrong side out so the print wouldn't show. The facings are a thin ivory colored cotton with a bit of embroidery, which is not ideal, but it worked. I'm using the same elm leaf pattern as I did for the very first one I made, and the sewing is basically the same as the previous poplar one. Tracing the outline onto the wrong side, cutting facing strips and angling the corners, sewing those together, and then very carefully stitching around the traced outline. The bumpy texture of the embroidery made it a little bit harder to press the edge down smoothly, and the facing does protrude a bit in some places, but it's not too bad. I tried reusing the painter's tape for a few of these, but it picks up lint and doesn't stick as well a second time. This time I used little squeezy bottles for the curved tips, which was definitely faster than using a small paintbrush, but the result is less smooth looking. I really love the look of the little venules on leaves and wanted to add some. I started with the largest size of metal tip to add some slightly larger bits of vein in the spaces, and then went in with the smallest tip and filled it all in with little tiny ones. Because only half of it shows when worn, I only needed to fill in half, and can also wear the planar side out if I want. Keeping a constant pressure on the bottle for that long was awful. I spread all this out over three days and my hand still really hurt and took a few days to recover afterwards. I think part of my problem might be that I only mixed up a small bit of paint, and maybe if I'd filled the bottle up completely I wouldn't have had to squeeze so hard, but either way, be careful, and stop if your hand starts to feel weird. You only get one pair of hands, and repetitive strain injuries are not to be taken lightly, 
Something to keep in mind about painting on one layer of fabric is that it will probably soak through, so it should be done on a surface that's easy to clean. The vinyl on my table has a bit of a woven texture, and even after scrubbing it, you can still kind of see the vein marks. After letting the veins dry overnight, I heat set it with the iron, and put it on just like the other ones. I like how it looks like an autumn version of the first one I made. This one also goes really well with a couple of my waistcoats, and is great if you want to disguise yourself as a dead leaf. Here are all my finished ones, the three I made for this video, plus the original dark green one from last July. I've been wearing them all a fair amount during the warmer part of the year, and will definitely make more. So that's all the methods I used in making these three leaf kerchiefs, but there are a lot more ways you could try. You could do the veins with lines of stitching, but it won't stretch as well on the bias. Stencils or screen printing might work, but there might be problems with the vein tips not lining up with the serrated edges. Um, and you definitely want to screen print it before sewing, so you have a nice flat even surface. You could also try using a fabric that's already printed with a mottled texture and it would hold up better to washing than the dry brushing would. I definitely want to try a digitally painted one and have it printed by a custom fabric printing website. I think that would be a great way to get it looking more realistically leafy and get all those little veins in there without totally killing your hands. And hopefully it would hold up better to washing. So I might do a part two video when I get around to doing that, but if not, there will be a blog post. I also drafted this pattern, which I haven't sewn up yet. It has a bit of a different shape for the visible back part and the ends that get folded because I don't think the maple leaf shape would tie as well. It's pretty easy to just make the pattern twice as wide if you want to do a weird shape that doesn't have good ends for tying. And then you can just make the corner plainer and smoother. There are other things you could do with the same basic design. You could make it really big and do a square skirt and maybe add a second shorter layer. I would love to see someone do that, especially with a mid-1910s inspired look. You could do it half diagonally and make a shawl, or a really tiny one for a pocket square. Lots of square things can be leafified. And you really don't need to do the fancy edges, you can just do veins on a basic hemmed square and it should still read as a leaf. Alright, I think that's everything. Thank you for watching, and I hope you go do some sewing. If you do end up making something from this video, I want to see it. Please post a picture and tag me on the social medias. I don't look at all of them every day, but I should see it eventually. Unless it's an Instagram story, because those disappear. As long as I'm here, I may as well mention that I've got a spoon flower shop with a variety of fabrics. Got some monsters, some dinosaurs, some queer frogs, and some other stuff. They're also on Redbubble, where I've got various other artworks too. And thank you to the people who support me on Patreon, where I post dinosaur comics and absolutely no sewing. Okay, bye. Oh, it's cold. Don't do this in November.